Committee of the Whole to order. And I will call Redevelopment Authority to order. Right. Um, we have a quorum for the Committee of the Whole. And we have a quorum for redevelopment. All right, would everyone please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, I pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America, America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Is there anyone for a public forum today? All right, seeing none, um, we will jump into uh, Committee of the Whole, approval of the minutes from our April 8th meeting. Is there a motion to approve the minutes from our April 8th meeting? So moved to approve. There's been a motion to approve and a second. Is there any discussion on our minutes from our last meeting? Seeing none, all those in favor of approving the minutes from our last meeting, please state aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Chair votes aye. Okay. Uh, Redevelopment Authority, approval of the minutes from the April 17th meeting. Chair will entertain a motion. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Chair votes aye. Opposed? Motion carries. All right. Uh, next, we'll jump into a presentation. Uh, 3.1, Development of Boots and Sports Complex. Who's going to take this one? Uh -huh. First, uh, before we start, if anybody's having trouble hearing me, if I need to move my mic or if you're not understanding what I'm saying, just flag me down and let me know that uh, you can't hear or that you didn't understand what I had to say. I know sometimes these mics are a little tricky. Um, with regard to how I'd like to present uh, our ideas and our concept and our development to you is uh, I'd like an opportunity first to show you what it's all about. What does it look like? What, is the, what do the plans look like? What does the design look like? And then after about uh, 20 to 30 minutes or so of discussion about various aspects of our development, I'll open it up for questions for all of you. And I'll be glad to stay as long as you see fit. And as long as you still have questions for me, I'll hang out for 10 minutes. I'll hang out for an hour. Uh, so uh, please, by all means, uh, I'm sure after hearing what we have to say, there's going to be a lot of questions. So we're hoping you'll ask. Um, <clears throat> You're probably wondering, who are these guys? Why are they here tonight? Some of you probably do have an idea. Um, my name is Joe Velkner. I'm Vice President and General Counsel for the Butson Sports Complex LLC, as well as Lakeshore United FC. Um, seated tonight in the gallery are uh, members of the Butson Sports Complex uh, Board of Directors. That includes Tony Cloco, Jim Vieser, Chris Lacey, and Mike Phil. They're here to lend support, answer questions if necessary, so on some subjects, I might defer to them with regard to specifics. Um, but at the outset, I just want to say on behalf of Boots and Sports Complex and Lakeshore United, thank you for the opportunity to present. Um, we want to describe for you what we believe is a truly extraordinary project for our community and an extraordinary development and opportunity for all of us. Um, if we can start the first slide, please. Lakeshore United is uh, Sheboygan's youth soccer club. Um, we have uh, more than 1,300 members, but tonight's development is really about a vision. Uh, it's developed and cultivated over more than five years of, of planning, of meeting, of discussions, and uh, it's what we view as our vision as being the finest sports facility, not only in the state of Wisconsin, but also the entire Midwest. We're starting from Lake Michigan. We're showing you the flyover of where Butson Park is and what it will be expected to look like. <clears throat> Lakeshore United is Sheboygan's youth soccer club. We have more than 1,300 kids uh, participate in our programs. They range from select soccer to recreational soccer, as well as camps and other events. We serve more than 3,000 parents. Um, and needless to say, as many in the room here can attest to, that uh, the coordination and programming of all of those things is a huge undertaking. Uh, and uh, likewise, 
the project that we're showing tonight is no small undertaking either. Uh, just by way of history, it uh, involves a parcel known as the Butts and Farms. Some of you may be familiar with it. Uh, it's located on Sheboygan's near south side on South Business Drive. At Butts and Farms, when the owners passed, the parcel was gifted to the city of Sheboygan. Uh, it had a restrictive covenant as part of that gift, and that gift specifically was that this parcel be utilized for uh, recreational purposes only. Butson Sports Complex LLC is the operational entity that's been formed to run this particular facility, both operationally as well as to develop this uh, particular parcel. We are currently engaged in a 25-year surface lease with the city of Sheboygan, uh, and we are going to develop and pr propose to develop this particular tract for that very reason recreational purposes. This not only perpetuates that legacy, that legacy that the Butson family left for the city of Sheboygan, but it's also the spirit of the family's generosity. And that is a promise we not only intend to keep, but that we intend to bring into our development as a whole. What is Butson Sports Complex? What is all the talk about? We want to show you a little bit about it. Butson Sports Complex is a 57 acre facility and parcel located on Sheboygan's near south side. It is located on South Business Drive, less than a half of a mile from the South Washington Street uh, corner. Uh, if I can have uh, visual number three, please. Page 19. <clears throat> this particular facility is envisioned as a multi-sport, multi-use facility. It has 16 sports fields. We can keep running to the next slide, please. Thank you. <clears throat> 16 full-size fields are envisioned here. It's planned and designed not only to be utilized as a soccer facility, but for all types of activities and sports. And we'll go through that a little bit later on in the proposal as to the specific activities that we are proposing. <clears throat> next slide, please. The facility envisions not only 16 fields, but it also envisions a championship stadium field, which is, you'll see in the upper left corner there with the stands, uh, that is going to be, uh, have a capacity of roughly 2,500 to 3,500. We will have four artificial turf fields as part of this development. And you'll notice that those are the ones that have the lights on them in that particular diagram. When we look at those of us that are engaged in spring sports, whether they be track, baseball, soccer, softball, tennis, all of these sports, this spring in particular, demonstrate the fact why, why artificial turf is so important uh, to a development such as this. As most of you can attest, if you have kids that play sports or are engaged in spring sports, we have a lot of washouts. We have a lot of missed times. We have a lot of schedules that don't get met because we don't have a facility or a surface that allows for playability. These four turf fields are just a critical component to that. Um, We've also got a very unique feature, and I think you see what it is in the upper right corner. That's an interior dome. It has a turf field underneath it. It will be utilized all year round. Um, and that is a very important feature we're gonna talk about as we go. The design also includes, next slide please. It also includes concessions, restrooms, shelters, lighting, parking, scoreboards, seating, and what we also are hoping that it will also include the most state-of-the-art technologies, including sound systems, informational systems, and digital technology for advertising purposes. These are all a part of what we are proposing in terms of a design. Next slide, please. We have engaged, as part of our design concept, is we have engaged Rettler Builders out of Stevens Point, Wisconsin, to provide us with the de designs and the graphics you're looking at now. Uh, Rettler has extensive experience in designing and constructing recreational facilities throughout Wisconsin. Uh, one of the things I would invite you to do is to visit Rettler.com and take a look at some of the facilities these folks have been, in, have been involved in in terms of design, which includes universities, high schools, and various other recreational facilities throughout not only Wisconsin, but the entire Midwest as well. Um, <clears throat> one of the things also uh, we want to show you, next slide please is what is building Butson cost? 
This particular graphic, I'm hoping it's clear enough for everybody to read. Page 24. Thank you. The total cost for the project, without going through the specifics, involves uh, two very special components. There's an east parcel, which is the majority of what you've been looking at, and also a west parcel, which includes grass fields. The total cost of this particular development, including all infrastructure and facilities that I talked about previously, is approximately $24,700. I think my eyesight is terrible, but I think that's what the number is. Correct, sorry. If it was 1,000, that'd be great. Okay. 22 or 24.7 million dollars. We invite you to take a look at the Rettler cost estimates contained in your materials. They can be found at the appendix of some of the materials you've taken a look at, and they include itemization of any and all parts of our project. These source materials include not only itemizations of the cost, but breakdowns by items and areas. I think with a price tag of 24 million, you're asking yourself, well, why, why build such a facility? What, what's the allure? Why would we want to do this? Um, and as we've maintained, and there are some folks in this room, they're familiar with the fact that previously we had talked to many of the members of the Common Council about a project involving Field of Dreams in Aurora several years ago. And in those presentations and as part of those discussions, we had stressed throughout and we stress today that uh, this is a community asset. This is not built simply for Lakeshore United. It's not built strictly for soccer purposes. It's got artificial turf, which means it can be utilized for a lot of different purposes. It's also got a lot of space and can be utilized for a lot of different purposes. We want to stress, as I have earlier, that this is a multi-use multi-purpose facility. It's a community asset. We view it as an elite first-class facility. And you're, you're asking yourself, well, for $24.7 million, I certainly hope it is. We're hoping that in viewing the materials we've showed that that's apparent in and of itself. Um, <clears throat> another strong purpose for doing this, and a, a great reason for doing this, is we're trying to attract and retain people in the Sheboygan area. We're trying to put together first class facilities throughout our community to keep and retain all the folks that live here now as well as those we're hoping will come. And we believe this facility can be a part of that particular selling point. Um, so again, I want to stress, it's a multi-use facility. It's not a Lakeshore United asset. This is a community, a city of Sheboygan, a Sheboygan County a greater Sheboygan area asset. That's what this is about. Um, as part of our preparation and part of our planning, uh, the Boots and Sports Complex LLC uh, engaged the services of S.B. Friedman. Uh, S.B. Friedman prepared for us uh, an economic impact statement. Can I have a next slide, please? Next slide, please. And one more. All right. The reasons that we've gone through hiring vendors such as S.B. Friedman is to demonstrate and to establish the economic impacts to both the city of Sheboygan and the greater Sheboygan area. Next slide, please. <clears throat> we have provided for you in your appendix materials the entirety of the economic impact statement prepared by S.B. Friedman. We believe, of course, for tonight's purposes, we're not going to go through the entire report, but there are certain highlights that we're going to talk about in just a moment. Needless to say, when we take a look at some of the numbers on this particular slide, the conclusions and the data and the economic impacts to our area are simply astounding. If we take a look at page 34 of your informational packet, we take a look at the total tourism impact. I want to point you to the 2017 um, table involving uh, spending here in Sheboygan County. Sheboygan's currently ranked 16th uh, in terms of direct visitor spending. That's a number of about $232 million. Um, this really begs the question, how can we 
improve that particular figure? How can we get more visitors to Sheboygan? How can we get more visitors to spend more money in our community? We believe this fa facility meets that need. It provides an outlet for visitors and for people to say, Sheboygan is a destination. It is a place where it's not just about soccer. It adds to our overall package of amenities that we offer to our visitors. And the complex boosts tourism. And what I want to do is take a look at some of the figures on this particular slide. When we look at it on balance, the numbers, and you'll find these in your EIS, the intention at the facility would be to run 80 to 85 events annually. That is a lot of programming, but we believe that this facility not only can accommodate that particular type of, of events and density of events, but let me give you an example of, of how this facility changes the game a bit. Uh, this last weekend, or, uh, we had our uh, Kicking at Lakeside tournament. Kicking at Lakeside is Lakeshore United's annual select tournament. And currently we run that particular tournament out of Horace Mann Middle School and various other sites uh, throughout Sheboygan. When you take a look at that particular tournament, there were nearly 200 select teams in our community, bringing nearly six or 7,000 visitors to Sheboygan. It included hotel stays. It included these people utilizing our hotels, our restaurants, our small business owners, our retailers. These are critical economic impacts for all of us, not just the four industries I referenced. Mm -hmm. When we take a look at that impact and we look at this facility, we would project the ability to run repeated tournaments, events, and various other types of uh, events over the course of a year that would generate similar numbers. Imagine for a moment five or six tournaments of the size of the Kicking at Lakeshore run at this particular facility. This has increased capacity to host those tournaments as well as the numbers themselves, not just once a year, maybe not just twice a year, five, six, seven tournaments drawing these kinds of numbers and these kinds of visitors. Those are big numbers, everyone. Let's take a look at the next figure right below that. It says 227,000. 227,000 227, represents the number of visitors annually that would come to Sheboygan as a result of this facility having been constructed. If we take a look at that again on balance, that is a lot of opportunities. That's 227,000 opportunities to spend another dollar, to visit another restaurant, to visit another store, to visit another hotel for an overnight stay. Those are great opportunities, everyone. As part of our EIS as well, uh, you'll see the next number, which is 23,500. 23,500 represents the number of overnight room stays that would be generated by this facility annually. That's a large number of overnight stays. There's also a number below that, 3.2 million. $3.2 million, according to our economic impact statement, is another $3.2 million annually in additional revenue, an economic impact, not indirect, direct. People who come, they spend their dollars here, and it's a direct benefit to our business owners, our restaurateurs, our hotelers, and all of the folks that are here. That's a large number again. The last number on that particular diagram is $4.9 million. That is an annual figure of indirect economic input. What does that mean in English? What that means is that that is companies and or businesses buying goods and services from other local companies and vendors. That, again, is a very sizable number and a very important economic benefit to our community. <clears throat> Last but not least, uh, you'll see the number 57 at the bottom. 57 full-time equivalency jobs would be created as a result of this particular facility. 
Now, we know, we know that Sheboygan is doing awfully well when it comes to unemployment figures and all of those things. That's great. This particular facility provides an opportunity for that status quo to continue and, in fact, improve. We see that as an outstanding opportunity uh, to maintain the current, I don't know what the percentage is, but it's quite low as compared to the rest of the state. We want to keep that. We want to keep that. Last but not least, and that's not included on this particular uh, diagram, but I want to stress this. <clears throat> By virtue of development and construction of this particular facility, in the, in the construction aspect of it, we are projecting 162 construction jobs in Sheboygan as a result of this particular project and development. That is a tremendous opportunity for our local excavators all of our local contractors and all the folks that are involved in those related industries to have an opportunity to work on our project locally. That's a great opportunity. And we're very proud that that's part of our presentation. Um, <clears throat> what people ask is, well, you have a first class facility. What, what, what do you do with that first class facility? How, how does it run? When you look at it from a programming perspective, I want you to take a look at your presentational materials uh, at pages 5 to 10. Um, and I'm not going to go through all the specific programming, but I do want to highlight a few things. The programming aspects of this particular facility involve youth soccer programming, stuff we've already talked about. We're talking about Wisconsin Interscholastic Athletic Association events, such as the state tournament, such as regionals, and other types of WIAA events. We're also talking about local high school games. Obviously, we have North and South, but we also have other area high schools that can utilize the facility. We're talking about the Wisconsin Youth Soccer Association State Cup Tournament. This is a huge draw in the state of Wisconsin. It involves kids and programs from all age levels, and we think we can bring it here. In fact, we are supremely confident with this particular facility, we would expect to have those competitions here. That brings in even more economic impact. <clears throat> what we've also got, there's some other things that we're leaving out. We've got soccer camps, we've got adult soccer leagues, colleges and universities, sports camps, exhibitions, domestic professional soccer teams. Um, we're talking about other sports, as we mentioned, multi-sports. We're talking about lacrosse, we're talking about rugby, football, ultimate frisbee sports camps, emerging sports. I want to talk about something that we initially, and there is the dome. From approximately November to about, let's say March, who knows, maybe even longer, there's a gap. What do we do during those months? How does the facility operate during those months? What does it offer? That dome, presents a unique opportunity to keep the facility running during winter months. It'll have artificial turf. It will have heating elements and will be able to be used for multi-use facilities. There are only three domes in the state of Wisconsin that are presently running. Marquette University. Marquette University certainly doesn't make that available to the general public in large part. We have our dome that we're proposing. And then there's one at, uh, at UW Oshkosh. We believe that this dome will be a tremendous driver of wintertime activity, something unique to largely outdoor facilities such as this. Um, this is a great opportunity. We've got golf academies. We've got indoor soccer, baseball training, health boot camps. The dome allows for all of these things, something that is part of the programming and part of the overall financial package and operational package, which we'll get into in a bit. Um, we're also talking about things like corporate events, holiday events. If we think outside the box, there's any number of possibilities here for this particular dome. Um, so we think that's another feature of this particular development that is unique and would make Sheboygan, again, a destination for these types of things. Now, <clears throat> are we thinking really about operationally. How, how does this place run? Um, as we all know, we can all put together the greatest pl you know, laid plans of mice and men, but if we don't run it right, and we don't operationally do the things that are necessary, it's a great facility that doesn't run right. 
To that end, um, we want to impress upon all of you that one of the key components to the development of this particular facility is operationally for it to run in such a manner uh, that not only is it self-sufficient, but that it also takes care of improvements, capital maintenance, and all the other bits and pieces that go with operation of large facilities. Um, one of the things we've built into our pro forma budget, which we'll talk about in just a moment, is we've put payroll into that particular budget. Payroll obviously means we have employees. What we would envision is having an executive director, a tournament operations director, a mate general maintenance director, someone who takes care of the facility, obviously, and a marketing person, someone who's directly involved in getting some of these events that we've talked about to Sheboygan. That's what we would envision to get the place up and running operationally to begin with. If you're going to build a first-class facility, you have to staff it with first-class people. We believe we're going to do that. <clears throat> now, what I would like for you to take a look at, next slide, please. And again, this highlights some of the um, multi-purpose sports facilities boosting our local economy. That can be found in your uh, materials as well. Next slide, please. And again, uh, and when we look at the uh, upper right corner, we look at the soccer family target audience that's contained in our ESI. If we look at those figures, those demographics we think match up very well with what we're trying to do at this particular facility, both operationally as well as developmentally. <coughs> with regard to expenses and revenue figures, next slide, please. All right. Obviously, when you run a facility of this size, we're not here to tell you or to even remotely suggest that there isn't any expense associated with this particular facility. Of course there is. We're not going to ignore it. We want to put it out there for you to look at. We look at the annual expenditures here as being all of those things. We believe the facility to be <coughs> self-sufficient in that regard, which leads me to our pro forma, which can be found as part of our economic impact statement in your appendix. Now, without getting too deep into the weeds with regard to the specifics, we're hoping that all of you will have an opportunity to review that. But the figures in that pro forma are not fiction. They're not wild guesses. They're not made up. Far from it. These particular figures and projections are on the basis of data that's been utilized uh, from facilities throughout the state of Wisconsin of like kind, um, such as Eli Soccer Park in Milwaukee, Shields Sports Park in Appleton, and like kind facilities throughout the country. These profiles that I'm talking about in terms of like facilities can be found at pages 12 through 17 of your presentational materials. Well, we're hoping you'll review that. <clears throat> um, As I referenced, um, we project the annual spending to provide enough operational revenue to not only pay our expenses, uh, but to provide improvements uh, and to pay debt service for the construction of this facility. And I pause because I think some of you not have now heard the, the words debt service. What is debt service all about? One of the things we're here to talk about is obviously with the price tag you've all seen, there's going to be a need uh, for some serious fundraising. As part of that, um, we want to impress upon you that we've thought about this very carefully. We have had very high level discussions with uh, uh, various folks about how this might be structured. And how is the facility going to be financed? Next slide, please. And the next one. And one more. One more, please. Very good. Our timetable for this is as set forth above. And in order to meet that project timeline, we're launching our capital campaign. It's 2019. I think we're right on schedule there. Uh, we're hoping to initiate our final design in the summer of 2019 with a finalization of our financing for this particular development in 2020. We're hoping for springtime, um, and we think we've got a very good jump on that. We're hoping to start construction in the spring of 2020 with a grand opening and operations to begin in fall of 2021. Next slide, please. And the next one. One more, please. 
Okay, very good. The concept of financing the Boots and Sports Complex will be found at pages 43 and 44 of your presentational materials, and I'm going to refer you to that. It's a three-pronged approach, three facets, the first of which is municipal bonding. We're going to talk about that in some detail in just a moment. We're looking to finance approximately $15 million in a revenue bond. We will talk about the specifics of how that will be done very shortly. The other second facet is the capital campaign. That is, is obviously that's not enough. Who do we approach? We're looking at corporate, local business donors, not only locally but statewide and even nationally in some settings. We're looking at that to be approximately five to seven million dollars. The last part we want to impress upon this is that even throughout this entire process, we haven't forgotten that we need to work with local sustaining partnerships, our local business owners, our local small business owners, brick and mortar things, things that all fundraising, from the bake sale to the broad fries to the sale of bricks to all of the things that are a part of putting together a community asset like this. Grassroots financing, and I'll call it that, is extremely important. Everybody in the community feels like I'm a part of this. This is something I helped build, that I'm a part of. We think that's an important component of what we're trying to do in this development, is that our local business owners have a stake in the game, that this is something they help construct. So um, we have hired a Milwaukee-based marketing firm to help us with some of those steps. Uh, Small Step Solutions, LLC, uh, is going to be assisting us in targeting uh, particular types of packages, sustaining partnerships, naming rights, loco placement, concessions, all of those things. The, the list is very exhaustive and something that we are going to be working with them to do. But this leads me to the point that I want to talk about in some detail, and that's talking plainly about the reasons we're here tonight. Of course, our first priority is to show you what, what is this all about? What does it look like? What are they planning to build? And we're hoping, as part of what we've shown you, is that it, it, the design, the, the development, and the programming for the facility, I, I'm hoping, and I'm, I'm optimistic in this regard, but that I, I'm really confident that when you view the materials, I think all of you have the impression, or will have the impression, that it's a first-class, first-rate facility. I'm hoping that's become very clear. But the issue of whether, um, how, how do we build it? How, how do we finance it? Um, and what we're looking to do, and we want to talk about this at some level with the folks in this room, is, um, is to propose uh, financial uh, backing with the assistance of a revenue bond. Um, as part of our concept, I would like you to take a look at the specific details at 41 and 42 and read those on your own time. That's a detailed discussion point. However, to direct you to page 44 is a general overview of what a revenue bond and our, our various sources uh, include. <clears throat> At the outset, um, I want to go back to the cost of the project. Um, and I want to impress upon everyone as part of those construction processes that we intend to seek in-kind services from our local contractors and so forth. We're hoping that the opportunity for them to be a part of this project will also uh, be an opportunity for us to realize some in-kind contributions towards our project. We're hoping to realize some of those. Um, secondly, um, as I mentioned, we'd be seeking a revenue bond of $15 million. Uh, this would begin our accumulation of construction funds. It's a city facility. We lease from the city of Sheboygan. I would submit to you that it is absolutely and critically important as part of this financial package, not only to outside donors, but outside prospects, corporations, and even in the grassroots arena, that it's important that we establish this project as being well-funded, well-organized, well-thought-out. And we believe with city backing on a revenue bond that that screams credibility. It screams that the city is prepared to back and to help finance something 
that is very special and very extraordinary. Taking a look at page 44 uh, to pay for the bond service, the debt service associated with that, the exact terms and conditions of that bond, we haven't reached that point at this point. We have a lot of discussions to undertake. But what we do want to do is lay out some foundational aspects of a bond. If you look at the current room tax revenue of the city of Sheboygan, the city currently generates $1.6 million annually at current levels in room tax. That figure is based on an 8% room tax rate as it stands currently. For the past 15 years, room tax allocations of $800,000 have been provided to the Blue Harbor Convention Center. As some of you in this room may know, that allocation or debt has recently been retired. <clears throat> Under state statutes, we believe that that is an opportunity that would certainly qualify uh, to be utilized for bond debt service. Additionally, and I think this is important for all the folks in this room uh, to talk to their constituents about, but it bears mention, it's important to keep in mind that room tax, as compared to other models, is not paid as a general matter by people who live here in Sheboygan. Room tax is generated on hotel stays. Most of that revenue is generated by people in overnight stays that are from where? Out of town. There's not a direct significant impact to the taxpayers of Wisconsin, or I should say of Sheboygan. It's generally paid by persons residing outside the county. <clears throat> when we look at the opportunity here, and as I pointed out, we have some real opportunities for economic impacts. We are proposing for consideration that we have a 2% increase in the room tax rate to bring the total to 10%. Many of Wisconsin's communities that are building these types of facilities or that are considering the construction of these facilities are using room tax dollars exclusively to design and to construct these facilities. Uh, I want to give you a prime example. Grand Chute in the Fox Valley has built a new indoor facility, uh, primarily indoor sports. That particular sports facility is financed solely by a 3% allocation of room tax to pay for the revenue bond to construct it. The Grand Chute indoor facility is a $30 million facility paid directly and solely by room tax. Now, we're not proposing that um, the development of our particular, or our particular development simply be funded solely, like Grand Chute, with room tax. We would like an opportunity. Um, our structure includes the following. Uh, obviously, the 2% room increase uh, that I referenced, at the current levels, at $1.6 million annually, a 2% increase is $400,000 in room tax revenue. The reason for our ask is the impetus is this, is that 2% is being asked for to build this facility. Therefore, the room tax increase generated by this 2% can be directly paid for debt service on this particular project that allocation would be utilized towards that purpose, to pay that debt service. As we've indicated earlier in our, in our uh, economic impact statement, the facility is expected to generate 23,500 room nights annually. At the 10% rate I indicated, with a 2% increase, that would generate another $234,000 in room tax revenue. Seeing as the additional room tax is largely attributable to operations and our particular facility, we would be asking that that portion be attributable towards the debt service payment. That total allocation is 
$34,000 and some change, as you'll see in, for, in pages 41 and 42. This is less, substantially less, than the $800,000 the city has been paying for the Blue Harbor Convention Center for the past 15 years. One of the questions you're asking yourself now is, well, how on earth is it proposed that the rest of the debt service get paid? Who's going to do that? Where is that going to come from? When you review the pro forma that's attached to your economic impact statement, you'll see that there has been an annual contribution or allocation of operational revenue of $600,000 annually over the life of the bond for debt service. When you take a look at that comparison as to Grand Chute, Boots and Sports Complex LLC is matching what it's asking for. It's a skin in the game. Some people call it motivation. It certainly is. As I indicated earlier, though, that pro forma is based on data coming from any number of like-kind facilities. So therefore, the total debt service allocation, including room tax, and the amount that Boots and Sports Complex and its operations would be kicking in to pay for debt service is $1.23 million a year. We believe that to be sustainable. We believe that to be appropriate. Maybe one of the questions you're asking yourself is, well, what might happen if uh, uh, when we start out this facility and it's not running at full capacity? We would propose to address that issue in two distinct forms, the first of which being we would seek to negotiate with the uh, bond issuance paying interest only on the bond for the first two years until the facility is fully operational. Obviously, interest only is a substantially smaller figure than the total debt service. Additionally, we would propose to escrow or allocate or segregate two years of debt service up front. In the event that there are shortfalls, we would be able to utilize that fund to pay any shortfalls. As part of the bond structure, that particular, those particular proceeds would be pledged. And we would talk to bond council about that particular issue directly in terms of negotiations. So when you consider our proposal and what we're asking for, and I understand everybody that $1.23 million annually is a lot of money. Nobody has any illusions about what it is. People want to call the project ambitious. You bet it is. We believe we're prepared to meet those burdens and to meet those obligations. What I want to go back to in talking about all of this, I want to extrapolate a little bit, get into some math here. When you extrapolate and you add over the period of time of a, of a revenue bond, which could be anywhere from 18 to 25 years, and I'll use 18 years as a conservative number. We take a look at the numbers provided in our EIS, and here's what those economic impact numbers sound like. Over 18 years from bond issuance, $58 million in hospitality, restaurateur, and other retail revenue to the city of Sheboygan and its surrounding communities. $88 million in indirect economic output, companies buying things from other companies. That's over an 18-year period from bond issuance. 423,000 room nights. 423,000 room nights. People who stay overnight, not to spend money for a day, not to spend money for a couple of days, but to spend money over a weekend. 423,000 opportunities to do that over the 18-year period of the bond. And last but not least, this is probably the biggest number 
that I'm going to share with you in terms of overall economic impact. When we extrapolate and we put together the numbers over an 18-year period for the number of visitors that come to the Sheboygan area over that period of time, 4.1 million visitors to Sheboygan. That's 4.1 million opportun additional opportunities for everyone to see the benefits. So, I'm expecting a lot of questions tonight. I certainly think when you show up and you talk about numbers of this size and the types of ambitious financing that we've got in mind here, um, we expect questions, but I want to summarize uh, for purposes of what our ask is. The first of which is we'd ask that the council and the RDA consider the increase of the room tax rate 2% for a total of 10%. Secondly, we would be asking for a room tax allocation of $650,000, which includes the 2% increase plus additional room nights that I talked about earlier. And lastly, that we would have an opportunity. Let's assume, for purposes of discussion, that the revenue operation from operations exceeds and performs extraordinarily well, which we anticipate that it will. We are hoping that the Common Council and the RDA would consider allowing our group to come back and discuss um, whether additional room tax allocations are appropriate. It's a merit-based system. You have to meet certain benchmarks. You have to meet certain performance aspects of it. Um, but at, a, at the very least, we'd have an opportunity to talk about allocations increased from what we're asking for tonight. And what I want to stress, and I'll wrap up, it's, I've gone a little longer than I expected to, um, but the guys in this room sitting in the back have spent a lot of time, along with all of our supporters, our parents, and everybody that we serve at Lakeshore United, and it's been a very, very long period of time. We believe that this is a once in a generational opportunity an opportunity to build something absolutely extraordinary. It's the culmination of years and years of planning, of meetings, of, of careful consideration, and all the things we talked about tonight. And I'll submit to you that once it's built, it's gonna be the finest facility in the state of Wisconsin and the finest facility in the Midwest. We all know that Sheboygan's a destination. We all know we have all the amenities and things that appeal to a broad group of people. We see this as just another opportunity to underscore the fact that this community is a destination. Always has been. This helps establish that, underscores, makes it better. It's value added. And I'm hoping that when you consider all of the things we've talked about, and I know we're throwing a lot of details at you, but I think when you take a look at this project and you see the passion of the big people who have been involved in this process over a long period of time, we're hoping you'll look at this in much the same way. We're hoping that there is that passion, that, that want to build this facility. Um, and I'll wrap up with that and just say on behalf of myself, the gentleman in the gallery from Boots and Sports Complex, our Lakeshore United FC board members and everybody, including myself, including our parents, our coaches, our supporters, all of our friends, and all of us in the community, we want to thank you, all of you, for the opportunity to show what we think is a very special opportunity to you. So thank you very much. If there's any questions, I'll be glad to take whatever questions you may have. All right. Thanks, Joe. I appreciate Th it. Thank you. Thank all you. right. So um, we'll move into 4.1. Debt financing related to the development of boots and sports complex items for discussion and possible action. Oh. Um, so this is a joint committee. So we're going to take turns um, with who's speaking. So, um, Bert, you want to say anything? Here, you've got a job. All right, we'll kick it off with Jim. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, when I read this over yesterday, I noticed that there was about 900 and some hotel or rooms available in Sheboygan County, and of course, this is gonna be a very pleasant problem for the, for the lodging facilities. My question is, uh, in any of your studies, uh, are there enough rooms 
to support not only this, but everything else that's going on during the summer. Uh, I mean, there's every weekend there's something in the, whether it be Elkhart Lake, uh, stuff in Sheboygan, the, the Greek picnic, uh, Bratwurst Day, all of the stuff that's going on, uh, is that a concern? Is it a concern? Certainly. But here's, it's an excellent question, by the way. And, and one of the concerns is we know we have a lot of things that go on. Um, but when you look at a multi-sport facility, when you look at uh, the opportunity to build and to utilize a dome and to utilize artificial turf, Alderman Boren, to, to your question, we're able to utilize a schedule where we can move things, where we have opportunities based on the amount of fields and space we have to schedule events that don't necessarily overlap, that don't necessarily run into Road America, that don't necessarily run into Brat Days, that don't necessarily run into other events. We've got that flexibility, and we will have a full-time staff that will be able to address exactly those concerns, is how do we maximize the operational opportunities here. So to your, to your question, we think we have the operational flexibility to avoid unnecessary overlap. If I could just follow up, Mr. Chairman, uh, this facility would be in my district 10 on the south side, and uh, mm -hmm. I like what I see here. Of course, we're going to have to work out all the numbers. Uh, of course. The other thing is, uh, I, I guess I could maybe ask Director Beeble this question, and that is, uh, in studying this over, unless I missed it, is there any, is there going to be any other financial responsibility for the city as far as infrastructure uh, on the location? You want to take that, David? At this, at this stage of the game, we do have some budgeted figures potentially for, let's say, utilities. We haven't put that necessarily in the capital plan. It's kind of like as a placeholder. One of the things is you notice the, the stormwater ponds, uh, they'll be necessary for the development, but there's an opportunity for us to leverage that and make them more regional, uh, especially the one to the, what it would be to the south of the site, which is uh, immediately right of the dome. That would serve also some of our industrial park so if it's sized properly, it would have other benefits besides just the parks that the city could then, you know, participate, obviously defray cost to this project directly. Um, and then again, that could be part of the funding package in terms of city support. That's where that he mentioned some of the in kind. And I guess that's something that, you know, we'd have to take a look at overall as infrastructure and where it makes sense for the city to participate or not to participate. Thank you. I would like to now talk to the committee of the whole members. I had the opportunity to sit for about an hour and a half um, with the gentlemen, Chris and Joe, um, and Daryl and uh, Bond Council on the phone. This project, and this is for everybody, this project is very different for the Redevelopment Authority. Typically, the Redevelopment Authority provides gap funding. So we are used to seeing projects that come in. We hear the project. They have personal equity in the project. They have collateral that we lean against. Um, they have a banking relationship that has already vetted numbers for us. So this is different in that case because this project is coming in whole for us. The second thing that is very different is we will be the bondholders. In my history on redevelopment authority, we have not been. So that's very different. And I would, I would have you go to page 45, if not now, later. But you see that the, the redevelopment authority is central to how we get this done. And it is very different and it is very unique for us. And, and having said that, not only the size of this project, but the differentiation of this project, I think it's imperative for the redevelopment authority who has not met on this yet, uh, that the redevelopment authority have 
just a redevelopment authority meeting, which will be open, but have a redevelopment authority meeting to talk about the whys and wherefores. Um, bond Council was on the phone with us. We also had discussion with um, Grand Shoot and the Grand Shoot finance director and the Grand Shoot manager, city manager, were on the phone talking about how they did it, how they were unique, how, how it worked for them. We have some similarities, but we don't have all the similarities. They had 10 communities. Um, we will have one community doing this. So my recommendation to redevelopment authority is to have us take this back and have a, a RDA meeting just about this or have it at our next meeting and continue the conversation. Okay, I'll go to Chad. So Joe, you had, <clears throat> you had mentioned in your uh, presentation that the event that you held last week or two weeks ago in comparison, is that event, what, what, is that, what is the size of that event to the size of the average event that will be at this facility? Soccer event. Yes. Correct. Thank you. Uh, Chad, good question. And, and, and when you look at it, uh, the tournament we ran a couple of weekends ago ran at Horace Mann as well as three other facilities. There's a reason for that, is that based on the school district materials at, and opportunities at Horace Mann, we had to run other, other sites. We believe this to be a self-contained type situation where the entire tournament is run at one particular facility. Directly to your question, we believe that the Kicking at Lakeshore event would be smaller in scale than events run at this particular facility for that reason alone, is that there's 16 fields, huge opportunities to run larger tournaments, not only larger tournaments, but more frequent. So in short, in summary, we believe that the events at the new facility would be larger in scale than those I described earlier. So, so can I follow up? So in comparison, is it 50%? Was that <clears throat> event 50% smaller than what you're going to run there? Or what, I mean, I don't want to put you on the carpet, but what what, I'm just trying to get a comparison of what's going to be at what's it. Right. Seated behind me, Chad, Chris Lacey is our operations director. That's, that's a question he can address directly. Five fields probably replicate 
what we had this weekend. So as a follow-up question, have you, have you contacted the hotels to determine what the room night stays were as it related to that? We had talked to various hoteliers uh, about capacity, and one in particular uh, was up to capacity for the entire weekend. Um, and we would expect, given the types of events uh, Chris described, for that to continue in large part. I can tell you, and I think it's intuitive in nature, is that I would have a difficult time believing that a hotelier, a restaurateur, a retailer would struggle or not care for having increased traffic, regardless of the issues regarding capacity. Now, of course, there are issues with that. But most of the hoteliers we've talked about were, if not at full capacity, darn close. And we would expect that to continue. Sorry, I just have one other point of clarification, then I'm done. You had mentioned that this before this council, before the Committee of the Whole and the RDA, is the decision to raise the room tax from 8% to 10% to allocate $600,000 towards the debt service payment and then um, the $15 million bond. Under state statute, the council has no authority, though, in allocating the room tax dollars. That's going to have to be mm -hmm. through, just so the council is aware, that's going to have to be through the room tax commission because by statute we have to turn our uh, room tax proceeds over to the room tax commission. That's certainly fair, and that's a consideration. I think the, the overriding question, Chad, is really this, is whether the Common Council and the RDA are willing to engage in high-level discussions about that particular 2% increase, then, of course, gets passed on to the room tax commission to make the final determination and make its recommendation. We certainly are not looking to supersede or end run any type of state statute procedure. That's not at all what I'm talking about. David, did you have a question? Yeah, I, I mean, obviously it does. Hey, David, can you use you your mic? You have to use your mic. Sorry. <laughs> You've obviously done a lot of work and a lot of thought in here. Um, you know, my, my child, I'm on the RDA, and so the question is, is, you know, for any expectation of us to do some due diligence on this thing, um, I mean, anything you read here looks great to me, but I have no reference point. I'm, I'm trying to think of how do we do our due diligence when we're asked to be the bondholders of $15 million when we've never been a bondholder of $1. Um, and so what, what kind of due diligence do we do? Um, you know, um, I mean, if this was a private bond placement there and there's a buyer of this thing, they're doing all kinds of due diligence on looking at profit and loss and related, you know, similar, you know, and so... I mean, are any of these other, do you have access to these other organizations that if we wanted to put together a list of people and try to get some financials from them to do some analysis of how these others have done, to put some kind of um, our own um, analysis to, the, to your numbers to say, yeah, these numbers are based on, or you can share with us, Joe, kind of the data that you use to put together these numbers or whatever, right? I'm just thinking, otherwise, I don't know, I don't know how I make a decision other than say, ah, it looks good, let's say, well, yes. Uh, <laughs> yeah, David, uh, I appreciate your point. Yeah. I think hey, what, Joe, you're what you're looking to do ultimately is to say, hey, look, all of these source documents and all these things contained in all these materials, these are all great things. But what do we look at to be able to verify these things? And what we've directed you to is as part of our pro forma as well as part of our analysis is like kind facilities and certainly we would make available for you the contact information you would want to take a look at as a matter of diligence right. to convince yourselves and have access to good information verifiable information that you can look at in order to make what you would consider to be an informed decision um, and certainly we can provide that and that yeah. is something we would ask as part of this we would fully expect those kinds of requests. Yeah, so I, I, somehow we got to get our hands on that because in my mind, and I'm not trying to draw a bad comparison, but of course. you think of your past experiences as um, the RDA had experience with a similar project that came on. They had really great presentations. They were convinced this was going to be a centerpiece in the Midwest, and it was going to bring all these people in and all these hotels, and triple play ended up not going anywhere. I'm mm -hmm. not saying this is the same thing. 
But how do we avoid that happening? That was on a uh, smaller multiple than this, you know. <laughs> that is and true. So we, and obviously the more we can do our due diligence, the more we help you be successful. I think this would be great for the community, but somehow we got to figure out how we do our due diligence. Right, and, and to your point, David, we would certainly make available yeah. to you any information that RDA wanted in order to perform whatever due diligence it saw fit. We would make that available. Because we're very confident, as I indicated, we're confident that source data matches up. And we think you'll find that. In fact, I'm very confident you're going to find that. Mm -hmm. That being said, me telling you and you looking are two different things. And we're hoping you'll do that. And we'll help you do that. Mm -hmm. And I am glad, as well as these gentlemen in the room, we're glad to make ourselves available for those kinds of questions. Where did you get this from? Who did and you talk to? If I can just, you know, I think for us, Madam Chair, is yeah. how does the RDA, I mean, who does this due diligence for us? I mean, is we, it the finance director for the I, city? Do we? I see Chen. Yeah. Oh. We've talked about this already. Oh, OK. So what I'm, what I'm going to recommend when the RDA meets at their next meeting is that the RDA goes out and hires an independent third party reviewer to review the performa, okay. the financials, mm -hmm. Uh, and the room tax projections. And we've got some consultants that we've been able to find that um, do this kind of stuff um, and do it on the sports venue and understand uh, those things. So we're doing some internal review right now and we're hoping that by the time the RDA meets the next time, we'll be able to come forward with some thoughts on um, some potential uh, third party people to bring to the table to help us understand these performers and make sure they're you know on course. And, and the other thing that we, and it's, it's, it follows on my initial comments is, this is a, a big departure from what we've already done, we've ever done. So we have to theoretically want to do this sort of thing. It's not obligatory. We have to want to do it. And then we can look at detail and do that at the same time. But um, RDA hasn't had the opportunity to do that yet but we'll make sure we do. Okay, I got a speaker's list going because I see some hands going up. So we got Marcus, Matt, Mary Lynn, and then Todd. So Marcus, you wanna go? Thank you very much. Um, I would just like to first make a statement. This seems like a really good idea, but uh, I'm gonna ask some pretty hard questions. Fair enough. So the, uh, what was the assumption for average occupancy Memorial Day to Labor Day when you were trying to figure out the room nights? What I will defer to on this is uh, the EIS statement addresses those specific data plans specifically. And instead of getting too far in the weeds on those issues, we'd ask that you have an opportunity to obviously digest that and take a look at it. Those assumptions are based on data from InPlan, which is the type of program they utilize. InPlan is a, is, a, is a program that's utilized by a lot of municipalities to assist it in determining what economic benefits are out there, including room nights and other things. So that's a part of, of that analysis. So a follow-up to that, the 22,000 room nights that we're expecting, is that countywide or specifically in the city? That is, I think for purposes of our EIS, that is a Sheboygan tourist district particular figure. It can include surrounding communities. It can. And are you reaching out to those other communities to assist with your uh, payments as well? We are. Thank you. Did you have a question, Matt? Yeah. Uh, just a quick question. Is, um, room tax rates in other areas, how does the 10% compare to what other municipalities have? Uh, Matt, with regard to the 10% rate, you're going to see 10% in a lot of communities uh, of similar size as well as larger municipalities that are utilizing 10% uh, as their base rate or as their capped rate. That is a common uh, theme in today's building of sports complex. It's utilized in uh, the Appleton Grand Shoot project I referenced. And there are specific allocations being made out of that 10% figure for sports complexes and sporting facilities. Okay. Thank you. Uh, one other question. Uh, we've talked a lot about the tournaments. Uh, one of the big revenue items in the P&L is hosted events. To, yes. Can you speak to what some of those are versus the tournaments? I just, just you know, 
I'm curious. I, I think this is best left for our operations person who has a better handle on the numbers than I certainly do in that regard. Chris. Mary Lynn. Uh, thanks. Um, and Chad, I appreciate your explanation on the room tax because that is a more complex entity than it used to be in terms of just because we raise the room tax from 8 to 10 percent doesn't mean we have total control over how that gets used. And we have taxpayers and business people who may not necessarily want that increase directed mm -hmm. solely to one entity. Maybe, maybe not. I mean, that's, that's a, a, a bridge to cross. Um, you know, when the city, and I've lived here for a while, when the city uh, does things that are beyond its mission and finances things that are businesses or whether it's a marina or a conference center, things have not gone well for us. Um, the city is engaged in providing basic services to our, our constituents. Um, certainly having an amenable community where people want to come and, and so forth is part of that. Um, but I'm thinking that first of all, it's a huge project. Um, and although I'm sure you will have many experts involved, it's as as Chair uh, Flicky Paneski has said, it's nothing we've ever done before. Um, and so I would be interested in a more scalable model, starting out small and seeing how that might go. I, I would probably need some sort of arrangement uh, where the city is held harmless. Some, some mechanism by which uh, our taxpayers, unlike the marina or unlike Blue Harbor, where they've had to pay in because we made business decisions that may not have been so, well, we did things that cities normally don't do. Um, I, I think we would need to have some, there's no collateral exactly, but I think we would need to think through. But my suggestion in terms of how we think about creative financing um, is a countywide sales tax. This is how uh, stadiums have been built in our state before. A small one, quarter percent, um, would raise a fair amount of money. Um, the, half, the half percent county sales tax now raises about $10 million a year. Um, and if there were a specific stadium, um, quarter percent, eighth of a percent, however it would be, then that interest on the part of our citizens and our residents would be shared throughout the county. Um, the city would be held harmless. You folks in an obviously extremely well thought through, well researched and pretty well documented proposal um, will be able to, you know, to move forward. Um, so those are just some random thoughts I have before I, I got to leave at 7.15, so I'm, I'm going to run out the door. But I, I just to say, I, I so appreciate the, um, I mean, for volunteer soccer hooligans here, um, you guys have done a, a professional a first rate job of putting a proposal together. It's, it's just I don't see the city and the proposal necessarily having a point where they meet, at least at this point. So thanks. Thank you. Okay. So next we have Todd, then Marcus, then Dean. So Todd. Thank you, Chair and Madam Chair. Um, I think you guys have done a great job putting this together. It's obviously well thought out. Um, obviously some, some great, you know, renditions and that. And I think that the, the overall spirit of this project is, is very positive. And I'm glad to hear that it's not 
this is this going to sound like an advertisement. It's not just soccer. It's other things. Um, but part, part of the many questions that I have, and, and we don't have a lot of time tonight to go through all of them with everybody, but is, you know, obviously this is something that we as a council, whether it's uh, the city council or the RDA, we really do have to take a step back. It's not something that we're, we're familiar with doing. It's, it's very new to us and we need to walk before we run. Um, as, as one of the elders, we've done um, what I consider a lot of aggressive uh, decisions and spending and changes within the last three, four years. And the economy has been very beneficial for us. Um, you know, I'm very concerned about the 15 million. I would really like to see, and I'm asking that you guys would provide us more details. Um, to me, right now, we're we're at that 5,000 foot level. We're looking like you like you did that aerial in the very beginning. I I really feel like I'm in that plane right now, or sitting on the droid, or whatever, and just kind of looking down. You know, when, when you talk about the the uh, number of stays at the hotels, I I would like to see a schedule of and better understand all of these soccer tournaments or just the tournaments in general. How, how that actually looks in the months that you're looking at. Because several times during your presentation you referenced the dome. And I think the dome is extra and that's extra opportunity to expand your, your seasons. That's correct. But there's only so many times you can use the dome for tournaments, and I, I, I need to I need to be educated, or we need to be educated on when are the tournaments, when are the the games and things, the opportunities available throughout the year. Because you, correct me if I'm wrong, but you're going to steal from Peter to pay Paul. Some of these tournaments are presently being taken care of by other communities, and you're hoping that they're going to come to Sheboygan's Great Diamond in the Rough, which is this. Uh, you know, assuming that we have that opportunity, but w how does that all play in, and then how does it play into the existing, as it was brought up earlier by our, our council, how does that play in and feather into what we already have established, whether it's Elkhart Lake or golf tournaments or just other f facilities and, and functions going on presently, and we have a five to ten year history that we can go back on and look and I would like to see that because I also look at the 894 rooms uh, hotel rooms and you know that's a broad stroke of the brush but there's also a lot of them that people don't like to stay at because they're not the greatest so when we look at this 800 plus you know is that enough and does it fit within the time span that you're talking about and then I guess I would like some better understanding of, of how the money comes in for you guys. Do the tournaments, does everybody that plays, if North High wants to have a, t uh, a game there, who pays for that? Is, you know, it's, you're, you're referencing that it's a city-involved community. You know, North High is not going to want to pay. South High is not going to want to pay. Is Plymouth going to have to pay? You know, how, how, how do you generate your revenues? Right, and, and t to your inquiries we'll call them with regard to getting additional information we we had roughly about an hour or so hour and a half to present yes. a very complex concept yes i have no illusions and nor does anybody in this room have any illusions that we were going to have an ultimate decision about some of these things when people come in and ask for significant sums of money we expect a certain amount of diligence and to that point we're hoping that you'll have an opportunity to wade into that pro forma that's been talked about mm -hmm in sufficient detail, because as I mentioned, we're very confident that those numbers are not only accurate, but they're spot on as compared to some like kind facilities. We think it's going to work. Now, just because I'm trying to tell you that it'll work doesn't mean you're absolutely convinced just because I say so. We expect you to ask tough questions and to look at those things. And we will provide everybody in the room with any information that they request. And if we don't have it prepared already, we will get it for you. We will prepare it for you. We will provide it. And let me ask another question, if I may. The, amount, the information, I mean, we've got two groups here. We have the council, of course. we have RDA. Um, RDA, we, we need to meet. We have mm -hmm. to put our, our questions together. But how do you 
want those questions to be focal, focused back to you. I, I personally don't think that having 10 alders call you <laughs> at 10 o'clock at night and ask questions are going to be a good thing. But I guess I'm just asking that right now. Who should RDA and the council be reaching through? Well, Joe, sure. Joe uh, excuse me, for a point of information, Alderman Wolf is the representative to the Redevelopment Authority, so he sits on both of these bodies. Of course. And, and thank you, Roberta. To, to that point, I think it makes a lot of sense if we're able to run questions your way, and you may sift through those, and you may, you know, go through those in sufficient detail to get those to me, then our group will, will dissect those and get whatever information we can for you, and we'll get it as quickly as we possibly can. And I'll also put this out there. If there is a need uh, of any, either RDA or the Common Council, I will make myself available, as will members of, of Boots and Sports Complex, to wade and to help you through those things, to give you background information, to help provide whatever information we can. I will personally make myself available for that. Um, all there has to be is a request to me, and then the gentleman in the back can help me do this. And, and we've done it as a group, and we're going to continue to do that. So I can be the point of contact if, if that makes sense for everybody. I, I guess just as a, as a, as a comment to uh, Joe's uh, mention of uh, fully expecting that there will be questions and more than happy to answer those, I think in order to better manage uh, that the process, uh, we will assign a city staffer uh, to collect the information. That way we don't lose something. And that way, too, uh, as we receive the information back, we can make sure that everyone equally receives the information. So if you don't mind, Joe, uh, we'll, we'll collect the, Not at all. the questions from RDA, uh, can be the whole members, and we'll forward them on. That makes a lot of sense. Thanks. Okay. Uh, next, Marcus. Thank you very much, Ms. Mr. Chair. Uh, I have some questions about how many parking spots are going to be on this plot. <laughs> That's a good question, but I, I believe that number to be upwards, it is in your presentational material, I believe that number to be upwards of 600, 700. I, right. Right. The, what will be the max? Right. With overflow parking in other areas, yeah. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, and could you explain how membership would work as far as a revenue source and how you, uh, um, memberships is the very first line in the P&L? Right. I'll let Mr. Lacey, our operations director, address that question. Uh, typically, in concepts like this, it would be similar to like uh, <clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh, my third question on the PNL would be re in regards to what you mean by holdovers for hotel rooms. I'm not familiar with that term, and I have a BA in hospitality. <laughs> <laughs> I'll again defer, Chris. And that may be a non technical term, but it's like when you set up a lot of these events, it's a state of play. So you're yeah. directed to the hotels that you go to. Um, Jim's going to the tournament in Kansas this coming week, and he's Jim's old, where he will stay. And as, as part of that trade off, there's, there's a, a, you can a lot that comes back. You can pay the Thank you. That answers my question. Very well. Thank you. All right. Uh, next on the list is Dean. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I guess my question that I have is, uh, do you have a, a plan B if this doesn't go this way? I mean, do you, or, and uh, is there any kind of thoughts of, of, of a phasing in of this, you know, possibly doing a portion of it? And then, you know, I, I know that this is all, but this is a lot of money and, if this doesn't come, come to fruition, do you have other ideas and other plans to go with this? We certainly do. 
We certainly do. We have multiple contingency types of situations. The project is a scalable one. Uh, it can also be done in phases. It can be done in any number of different ways. Uh, I will qualify that statement by suggesting, though, when you build a facility at full capacity immediately, you realize the economic benefits in an accelerated way, meaning that if we phase things in, the economic performance is not necessarily the same as you would expect at a facility at full capacity. So obviously, the preference is to build the entire facility as quickly as possible. But to answer your question, it is scalable, it is workable, there are contingencies. Okay. Right, Barb? Thank you. Um, on page 44, you have the listing of 15 million plus 5 million plus 2.5 million, which um, my computer brain says that's 22 and a half million. Right. Um, so we're a little bit short there. Um, is there a reason for that, or yes. um, are you building that in somewhere else? <laughs> We're looking to scale back some of the construction costs by virtue of in-kind contributions as well as other discounts. So that's how we've got it built in. We have a reasonable expectation that there's going to be a reduction in total cost. That one was already built in there into the um, 2.5 was uh, in-kind. Are you hoping that you can bring We're hoping we're going to get down to that $22.5 million level. Okay. And um, the surface, is, is that grass or is that artificial turf that you're putting in? Both. Um, the environmental impact um, from, have you looked at that at yes. all? Um, because uh, then you're using equipment to Correct. cut the grass and... Turf fields are is, is environmentally responsible in the context of how they're maintained and installed as is a grass field. Okay. And I have one more. Of course. Um, the parking spaces, um, have you looked at maybe charging for the parking rather than yes. the increased tax um, room rate? Um, because everywhere I go, I, I pay for parking. Right. So, you know, if you put a couple mm -hmm. bucks per car on six to 700 sure. spaces, um, you can make some nice chunk change there. And, and I certainly appreciate that. That is a part of revenue, however. Um, that is not an issue with regard to debt service payment. That it goes into the $600,000 we talked about as our own contribution towards that. Parking is something we've always charged for. We intend to continue doing that. But that particular revenue goes to revenue for operations, okay. which will be utilized for debt service. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Marcus again. Last this three, I promise. Committee of the whole. You can ask more <laughs> questions, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so the, you mentioned 4.1 million visitors to um, Sheboygan County. Correct. Are they duplicated or unduplicated? We anticipate those as being largely unduplicated. Fantastic. Uh, and then the current threats or um, other construction that's going on as far as more domes in the state of Wisconsin, uh, are you aware of any? Have you researched this? What's that? We have, and one of the things I indicated earlier is that there are only three like-kind facilities that are, are utilizing a dome, one of which Marquette University, not particularly accessible uh, for general use, and the other being Oshkosh, and ours would be the third. Um, there are some similar type of dome facilities, but there's no current construction for domes that we are aware of. Thank you. Uh, my last question would be, uh, do you have any prospects or a short list for the executive director, and would they be local or coming from outside of this area? We have discussed uh, that possibility. I would say largely, without giving away the store, obviously, is that we have had discussions with both local as well as uh, others from outside our community. We would hope to fill an executive position with someone locally. Could you uh, describe the ideal candidate? The ideal candidate for an executive director position is someone who can manage uh, uh, three components. We have marketing, we have peace persons who work in uh, uh, tournament directions, you know, directorships, uh, as well as uh, field maintenance. That executive director is going to be someone who is going to be responsible for man the management of those three things to make sure that synergy is there. Um, and my idea of an ideal candidate is someone who has outstanding organizational skills because it's a lot to manage, as I mentioned earlier in my presentation. The second is that it has to be a person who can work with a wide variety of different folks, because there are going to be people in maintenance, there are going to be people doing tournaments, there are going to be different aspects. It's having a broad-based knowledge basis, if you will, is a critical component of that particular position. We view it as much the same as we would for any administrator of a large facility, is the kind of character traits, time management, 
high organizational skills, those kinds of things. Those are absolute necessities without, a, without question. Thank you for putting up with me. <laughs> Thank you. All right, uh, the speakers list is exhausted. Is there any other questions? No one else? Okay. Anybody, RDA, we're good. Is there any motion or I, I don't? Second. Well, there, there wasn't a motion made. I, I don't believe we, <laughs> this is just an information, okay. receiving information, so. Oh, well, I, I'm, not, I'm not recognizing that motion at this moment, so. Yeah, that's great, um, that's great. I'll so I think. That's good. That's, 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 that's your me. motion. No, no, he said RDA. Oh, RDA. I said RDA and Matt Perfect, and Matt both. seconded. Okay, RDA moved and seconded to discuss this further in committee. All those in favor say aye. Oh. There's a oh. Can I just ask, is there, is there a good, is this matter going to the Tourism Commission first to make sure that they even approve or even are, are in favor of the, the use of the uh, room tax money? Because this is a dead issue. If the room tax money isn't there. Yeah. It, we should probably have first pass at it. Why would we have the first pass? Right. At least on the scale that this was presented. Yeah. This is Daryl. Um, uh, from from the questions we received tonight, uh, we don't have all the answers. Uh, there was some, in essence, research assignments that I heard. Uh, that additional time uh, needs to occur to, as a follow up. Uh, I think uh, both the RDA as well as the Committee of the Whole need additional information. Uh, and I think we're better prepared uh, to do that homework. Uh, consultant was mentioned to probably assist either the RDA or the Common Council. And I think all that information needs to be pulled together prior to asking the uh, Tourism Commission to, to consider this. I, I think there's, there's uh, a vacuum as far as some information that I think is critical that we don't have at this time. So I would not support going to the uh, Tourism Commission at this time. Todd. Thank you, Madam Chair. I guess the reason I'm sa suggesting that or making a motion to go to RDA is so that we can start formulating some of our questions from that level because until we can get it to other groups, if we don't have our, our questions answered, we can't even support it or answer questions that the other groups are going to come forward with. Mm -hmm. I think right now we're still at that 5,000 foot level. It's a great opportunity, but it still needs to be vetted by um, multiple areas, including, you know, um, travel and tourism and that. Right. Okay. There's a motion on the floor to send this to committee and hold a committee meeting. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Motion. Mo Chair votes aye. Motion carries. Thank you, gentlemen. Okay, uh, now Committee of the Whole. Um, I guess this we just received the information, so there is no such motion that needs to be made. Um, is there a motion to adjourn for the Committee of the Whole? Motion to adjourn. <laughs> There's been a motion and second. All those in favor of adjourning the Committee of the Whole, please state aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Chair votes aye. The Committee of the Whole is adjourned. Uh, we have one more question from RDA. Perfect. Okay. Chair will entertain a motion to adjourn RDA. Motion to adjourn RDA. Thank you. Is there a second? Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Chair votes aye. We are adjourned. All right. Thank you, everybody, Thank for coming. You.